A message from Lucas Walton from the Walton Family Foundation, a funder of this event. Hi, I'm Lucas Walton from the Walton Family Foundation. We're here today to talk about big problems, but also innovative solutions and the state of what is a complex problem in the face of climate change for the Colorado River. The Colorado River is ground zero for climate change. This is a crisis that involves all of us. We care about the Colorado River as a foundation and as a family. We realize how important it is to America. We realize how important it is for tens of millions of people who are affected every day by the ability to have access to water. That concerns me for the next generation coming down the line. I think that there's hope for the future because I see innovation because I see creative solutions, and in that, we are seeing voices come together to have a common conversation in a way that we haven't seen before. That gives me hope. That allows me to look forward and say that so much more is possible. There's a better version of us out there where both people and the environment can thrive together. If we can come together to find solutions for nature and people, we can create an example that communities around the world can look to. Funding for this program is provided by It's November 10th, 2021, live from South Mountain Park, overlooking Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome to Tipping Point, River on the Brink. I'm Miles O'Brien, the science correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Over the next hour or so, we are going to dive into a growing crisis of utmost importance to people all throughout the Western U.S., including those who live here in the place they call the Valley of the Sun. It's a thriving metropolitan area of five million, and that simply would not have happened if it weren't for the Colorado River. It is the primary source of water here, and it has become the incredible shrinking river. The reasons? a historic two-decade-old drought supercharged by the climate emergency. In August, the federal government issued its first-ever shortage declaration for the river for the booming western United States. For cities like Phoenix, this is an existential crisis. The Colorado River, almost 1,500 miles long, winds its way through seven states and into Mexico. The river basin is filled with lush natural ecosystems. It transforms six million acres of barren desert into fertile farmland. 40 million people are sustained by this water. It's the most heavily utilized river in the U.S. And it starts here as a deep blanket of snow high in the Rocky Mountains of Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado. In the spring, when the snowpack melts, water flows downhill, nourishing plant and animal life and filling the streams that feed the mighty Colorado River. Most of the water in the Colorado River starts as snowpack. And one of the reasons is that mountains act as these big catchments of precipitation. The snowpack is like a huge natural reservoir of water in a part of the country where there is very little of it. So how best to share it? In 1922, then Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover met with representatives of river basin states. They signed the Colorado River Compact, which determines how the precious resource is allocated. Once the states agreed on their fair shares, they each established a seniority system, first in time, first in right. There's kind of a hierarchy of water rights. That means that people who gained access to the river first, they have what we would call a senior water right. The signers of the pact factored in 18 years of flow data from the early 1900s, but it happened to be an extraordinarily wet period of time. The Colorado River Compact was overdrawn from the start. For years, they tried to make up the deficit by pouring concrete 
to retain and redirect the river in bold, ingenious ways. The Hoover Dam, which spans the river between Nevada and Arizona, created the largest reservoir in the country, Lake Mead. It is the most famous feature in an expansive network of dams, canals, pipes, and pumps. These reservoirs that we've built, this whole system of water supply is truly amazing. And it's allowed our society to grow and to thrive in a way that just would not be possible whatsoever without the reservoirs. But today, after more than 20 years of drought, 100 years of increasing global temperatures, and relentless demand on the river, the two largest reservoirs, Lake Mead and Lake Powell, are at all-time low levels. Water from the Colorado River no longer makes it to the Sea of Cortez. And for the first time, people at the bottom of the allocation list are being denied their share. There is little to suggest this trend will reverse anytime soon. For years, humans overspent the Colorado River and nature covered the overdrafts. But now the bill has come due. Back live in Phoenix, and I think we can accurately call this a summit on Colorado River water. Joining me here uh, on this spectacular precipice to talk about a river on the precipice is a man who knows an awful lot about Colorado River brigsmanship, John Fleck. John, good to have you with us. He's a member of the faculty at the University of New Mexico, a recovering journalist. We, 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 that's okay. Yeah. There's a 12-step program for yeah. that. And he's the author of two fantastic books on the river, which I, I recommend to you. Before I get started with questions, I do want to encourage all of you to participate. Send us a comment or a question wherever you are watching uh, this live stream, and we will do our best to read it. Uh, we've gotten some questions in advance, and I actually want to start with one of them. This speak uh, comes, it's a tweet from Scott Harlow. John, he writes, on the brink, hell, it's a dead river. Try finding where it empties into the Gulf of Mexico. It doesn't. We're going to talk more about that later. It eventually peters out somewhere in the desert. Too many people tapping into the water supply. It isn't a dead river, though, is it? It's not a dead river. It brings life to the region. There's 40 million people in the United States and Mexico who depend on it, the cities of Phoenix and Las Vegas, the farmers in places like Yuma and Imperial. Um, it very much brings life to the West, and it continues to do that even in its most threatened state. And the question is just sort of how do we keep that going? It does have a lot of resilience when you consider how much concrete humans have poured around it, right? right. And the resilience comes from these human communities. I mean, we have this adaptive capacity. Um, when things change, we change with them. Um, so it's not dead. I mean, there are places where it's definitely dead, where there's no river down in the Delta. And we'll be talking about this later. Um, but, but this is life right here. This is a, a living community that thrives and depends on this river yeah. and can continue. It, it's extraordinary to think five million people live in this desert environment. Yeah. So how dire is it right now? So this year um, scared a lot of us, I think, in ways that go beyond anything those of us who worked on the Colorado River had seen before. We had a decent snowpack. Not very much of that water ended up in the river and in the reservoirs. Um, Lake Powell dropped by 50 feet, Lake Mead dropped by 15 feet. And to sort of put that into context, the total loss of water, we use acre feet, five and a half million acre feet over the last year, is the equivalent to like 20 years of water supply for the city of Las Vegas. It is a lot of water that was drained out of those reservoirs. That, that's a stunning number right there. Yeah. And, and that gets people's attention, obviously. Yeah. And, and it's important to remember, like, the reservoirs are doing what we designed them for. We were going to fill them up when it was wet and use the water when it was dry. And we had some very dry years, and we've used it. But the buffer is running out, and the crisis becomes more real as the buffer runs out. Well, let's, let's set something straight at the outset here. Are the people who live down below us here, uh, are they facing the prospect of running out of water? Will the spigots go dry? No, the, the spigots are not going to run dry in a place like Phoenix or, you know, Las Vegas, San Diego and Los Angeles, Tucson, all these cities that depend on the Colorado River. Um, these cities will change. They will have to adapt to a climate change world with less water. But we've seen that, that the cities can do that, but they will be very different places. And they will face really difficult choices, the communities that depend on this river, in order to continue to exist. 
You know, it's interesting. Uh, denial comes up here, and we're not talking about the river. <laughs> that, that We're talking about denial in the sense that at the very outset, you've documented in great detail in your books uh, that political leaders pretty much overlooked what scientists were telling them from the outset on how much water is really in that river. Uh, and to this day, there is concern that there's skepticism and denial about climate change. Is it time to get a little more real about what the river can really do for people? Yeah. So, so the story of what happened 100 years ago is important. There was a scientist for the U.S. Geological Survey called Eugene Clyde LaRue, who was a guy the nation hired to tell him how much water is in the river. And he said, y'all, there's not as much water as you think. Maybe you shouldn't be doing all these things. He was ignored. Um, and we have a history of ignoring that science. And we're reaching the point where we can't ignore that science any longer. Um, there are signs that we're doing a lot better. There are some concerning signs that some um, people in the political leadership, especially in the upper part of the Colorado River Basin, are not willing to make some of the hard choices that are required when you recognize that this really is a shrinking river. You know, climate change is, <clears throat> you know, generally we think of it as being slow moving. But yeah. when you look at water issues, hydrology, that's kind of a leading edge indicator, isn't it? You know, Brad Udall, who you're going to be talking uh, um, with later, um, my friend, um, uh, has this thing that he likes to say that climate change is water change. Water um, changes in the hydrologic cycle are the way that climate change most immediately manifests itself for humans and ecosystems. And here, climate change is manifesting itself in having less water. So we have a question here um, from Rick in Utah. And he says, there's no doubt that the Southwest is experiencing a protracted drought. But what evidence do you have that this drought is any different from historic droughts of the past? We're going to get into that a little more, but just your thoughts on that. Well, so work, and again, Brad Udall, who's going to be on this program, has done some of the most important work um, ha demonstrating that the decline in the flow of the river is greater than can be explained by the changes in precipitation that we are seeing. We know that temperatures are warming. We know they're warming because of greenhouse gases. We know in that warmer atmosphere, less water ends up in the river. And that's exactly what we saw this year when the reservoirs dropped so much. Yeah, we will we'll get into a little more detail on exactly how climate change uh, works. And it's, it's a little more complicated and, and nuanced than, than you might suspect. Uh, when you look at solutions, uh, we do have a question here about whether there's a market-driven way to, to handle this. Um, is it possible that David from Arizona has this one? Will the ability to market water between states be developed as a way to reallocate water from upstream states to the lower basin states? In other words, you've got this agreement, but can the free market sort of fix the inequities that exist today? I think that is unlikely at the scale that, what was it David's question? Yeah, David. At, yeah. at the scale that David is talking about, moving water across state, um, state lines, um, uh, management of the Colorado River is based on some fundamental agreed on, generally agreed on principles, and one is that states work within their own boundaries. Um, but more generally, markets can be tools that are useful, but, but water is something that doesn't lend itself well to market mechanisms. It's so big and heavy and place-based. Um, uh, but, but the other thing is that markets have some really problematic equity issues because poor rural communities can really suffer if we're not careful about how we establish and operate the kind of market mechanisms. And, and we don't want to see these rural communities just have their water rights sold away and disappear. And that's the rub, because there's so much demand here. They've got money to pay for the rights, and that uh, might get you water, but it might destroy a community, right? Right. And we don't want to do that. And, and we see some really innovative and creative mechanisms where some money goes to um, a, a farm district or a community to fo fallow a little bit of their land. That water can go to the city, but it, it provides capital for agriculture that remains in the community and keeps most of the land in farming. And we see a lot of those kind of creative agreements that respect the integrity of these rural communities and keep them farming and growing the food that we love um, and need. Um, and, and so there are ways to do it, but we have to be careful um, about thinking that the markets are going to be a panacea. So there's that famous uh, expression that is attributed to Mark Twain, but you discovered it actually wasn't him, but well, that's off yeah. to the side. Whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting. Is that real in any way? So one of the interesting things about 
you know, the work that I've done on the Colorado River in the last 10 years, and I expected that, and I was looking for conflict as a, as a young writer trying to write about this stuff. And, and what I found is that rather than conflict, what you see is these collaborative agreements about how to share this scarce resource um, that are mutually beneficial, um, communities helping one another, swapping, trading, sharing, and money changes hand, and conflict can be a part of it. It's not like this is all nice sharing cookies on the kindergarten playground. Um, but collaborative agreements have been much more successful and much more common, especially in the last 20 years in the Colorado River Basin, last 30 years in the Colorado River Basin, and really do a lot better job of doing what we want to do, which is sort of preserve all of this. All right, John Fleck, we just got you started. You're going to come back a little bit later, so stay close. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, if you have a question or a comment for John or any of our other guests, as they uh, come along here, we want you to chime in. We've already gotten a few good questions. We'll start working them in. You know, let's take advantage of the fact that we are live here and make this a conversation. You can send us your questions, and I will do my best to include them, uh, as many of them as I can. Well, to say the Colorado River is in crisis because of the climate emergency is an oversimplification of a very complex set of problems. The river is and was way overutilized and is in the midst of a natural cycle of drought. A warmer climate is just one more thing, making matters worse. And its impact on the problem is complex, and it's often not obvious at all. The Colorado River rises and falls amid natural cycles of wet and dry conditions. But around the year 2000, a drought took hold and has not let go. This means less snow on those peaks in the Rockies year after year, and thus a steady reduction of water to feed the river. In Western North America, we have tree ring records from tens of thousands of trees that combined tell us in any given year how wet or dry the soil was. The Western United States has been as dry as any other 22 year period in the last millennium. The tree ring records tell us the drought that we're in today is not gonna last forever, that it will break at some point when we have a string of really good luck years. But the climate emergency has changed the odds. The global temperature is about two degrees Fahrenheit higher than it was before the Industrial Revolution. If climate change hadn't happened, the West would still be in a drought, but the severity of the drought is undoubtedly worse because of climate change. Here's why. Warmer temperatures mean drier air. As the snowpack shrinks, it sheds water vapor into the atmosphere. A larger amount of snow melts into liquid water and rapidly evaporates in this warmer climate. Now the soil is drier than usual. This causes the soils to act like a very dry sponge. And the next precipitation event that occurs on top of that dry sponge is going to work to refilling the soil sponge as opposed to refilling our rivers and reservoirs. What might have been snowfall becomes rain in warmer temperatures, and rain melts the existing snowpack. That snowpack would have reflected sunshine like a mirror, but as it shrinks, the darker ground underneath retains more heat, accelerating the melting process. Now plants start using up that water earlier in this warmer spring and that causes soils to become drier earlier in the year than they would otherwise, leading to summer times where soils are far more depleted in moisture than they would have been if the vegetation had been forced to wait until summer to begin growing. So now it's dry and hot, a recipe for wildfires. And burnt up vegetation doesn't drink the water that it used to. Suddenly, we can have the opposite problem. Too much water rushing down the mountains overwhelming the environment and the infrastructure. A lot of that water comes rushing down all at once. It's carrying pollution after the fire and carrying huge amounts of dirt. Our reservoirs in the West are not made for gigantic pulses of water coming down the mountain at unexpected times, carrying unexpected things like pollutants and dirt. The climate emergency is changing this river in ways that are often nuanced, sometimes unexpected, and always devastating.
Joining me now live in Phoenix is Brad Udall. He's a senior scientist at Colorado State University, a scientist who happens to be a member of one of the great political and public service dynasties in the West. His late father, Mo, served 30 years in Congress, a Democrat from the Tucson area. He was a contender for the presidential nomination in 1976. And he had some great quotes. One of them was, the more we exploit nature, the more our options are reduced until we have only one to fight for survival. Uh, Brad, good to have you with us. And I'm curious, those words are rather prescient to this moment and what we're talking about tonight. They are indeed, and I miss my father dearly and his brother, the late Stuart Udall as well. Yeah, yeah let's talk about, first of all, this idea of climate skepticism. Um, you know, there, there was obviously a lot of scientific denial from the outset when the framers of the Colorado River Compact ignored what the scientists were saying about how much water is in the river. Today, are you running into uh, good veins of skepticism when it comes to talking about how the climate emergency is making matters worse? So when I first started working on this in the year 2000, I would give talks dirty looks. That has radically changed, and major water providers in the West now actually have climate scientists helping them to figure out what the future will hold. That said, I recently gave a talk to some upper basin decision makers, and I was later told that at least one of them expressed great skepticism that humans are actually changing the climate. And the reason that's so concerning is that if you don't understand the nature of the problem, you're gonna come up with a solution that's less than adequate. So let's talk about um, the projections for the river. I mean, obviously, uh, human beings have tried to control this river in a lot of ways, but the, ultimately the supply is pretty well fixed by nature, and we're, we're kind of riding this out. What do we know about what the river is going to be delivering marching forward? So we continue to talk about this as a drought, but it's really not a drought after 22 years. The scientific term that we're trying to put in circulation is a mouthful. It's called aridification. It's the long-term warming and drying of the American West. And as Park Williams described, it involves lower snow packs, more heat, drier soils, earlier runoff, poorer water quality, a whole host of things come along. Projections that I and other scientists have made indicate that the river might lose another 20% by mid-century. So it's down 20% and it could lose another 20% to get us to 40% low relative to the 20th century by mid-century, a mere 30 years from now. Those are, those are rather frightening numbers that you, you bandy about there. So uh, They are frightening. Yeah. They're totally frightening, and I basically call myself the skunk in the room regularly. <laughs> Tracy from Colorado has this. Has anyone calculated just how many people the region's water supply can actually support for the long term? As unpopular as it would be, seems like limits on new growth and development based on water supply would be necessary. We get a lot of questions like this. I'm sure you do too. Yeah, you know, I would argue that these cities have done remarkably well about conserving water. And in fact, most cities are using less than they did 20 years ago. I don't think water supplies in the Colorado River are necessarily the limit on growth here. I mean, there are questions about how much ag you can support based on its 70% use. Um, but I would not tell you that water would be the limiting factor here for these mega cities in the American West. Whether or not you're going to want to live here is a whole other matter in the 21st century as it continues to warm. Yeah, there'll be other issues, I guess. But water shouldn't be the limiter. I don't believe it will be the limiter, no. These cities have shown remarkable ability to conserve, and I think we've just touched that. There's a lot more to be done. You talk about how there should be a fundamental rethink about how the river is shared. What does that mean and how possible is that? We've got a hundred year old agreement. It doesn't seem like a lot of people want to rip it up and start over. No, and I don't think you should rip it up. Um, you know, the compact has five main clauses in it and they're all based around hard fixed numbers. Those hard fixed numbers can't possibly work in a river that's declining. In 1948, the upper basin states had their own compact and they based it on percents. And frankly, I think we need to a percent, move to a percent based allocation to make this work. And let me make one other point. And that makes really good sense, by the way. I yeah. don't understand why that didn't happen in the first place, but finish your point. So the point is the guts of the Colorado River Compact are five sections in Article 3. And every one of those sections has a major problem, a dispute over terminology that was never defined 
or uh, misinterpretations or disputes between the upper basin and the lower basin, and we need to resolve that. This, it's 100 years old, and we don't know what this document means. <laughs> so, Constitutional Convention, is that what we're talking about? What could be done? Listen, there are bright minds in the basin, and we can figure out how to adjust this. There are deals and bargains to be made here. Everybody has a major risk. The upper basin has a risk, the lower basin has a risk, and within those risks are opportunities to reduce the risk, build a resilient system, and build a, a compact that actually works. So, you, the, the, the whole pro idea, initially, was that states that weren't growing as quickly uh, wanted to preserve their water rights over time, mostly thinking about California, which was growing so rapidly. It was before this became what it is today. That was the basic idea, preserve the uh, an amount of water marching forward. Uh, but over time, that hasn't really worked out very well for the upper basin states. They don't use their full allocation. Meanwhile, in the lower basin, they're using everything and more. And ultimately, it seems like places where you live in Colorado are stand to um, be in, in worse shape as this marches forward. So the compact's a complicated document and back in 1922 the upper basin states were terrified of a voracious California and so they cut California loose to deal with Arizona and they got the promise that they could grow at their own rate and they now feel because they only use 60 percent of what the lower basin does that they're entitled to grow into that remaining amount problem is 100 years later the facts on the ground are fundamentally different and that water's not there for the upper basin to grow so no matter how much they want to do it it ain't going to happen let's talk a little bit about saint george utah uh, which is a fast-growing part of uh, southern utah uh, and uh, the community and Utah is saying, hey, we want to put a straw in right now yeah. to support growth. We have water rights uh, that we want to exercise. It seems like it's pretty bad timing to be asking to put a straw in this river. So the first real holes, right? When you're in one, stop digging. <laughs> Uh, St. George uses a vast amount of water per person. They have not pursued conservation the way other municipalities have in the, in the basin. Um, it seems that there's adequate local supplies. And I would also argue that there's an equity issue here. The state of Utah recently got a, a settlement with the Navajo Reservation in Utah. And the amount of that water is actually equal to the water that St. George wants to use. Where should that water go? We should have a debate about that. But do people there have a right to that water? So nominally under the compact, they do under this 100-year-old agreement. But does it make sense in the 21st century? Arguably, no. What about injecting the free market, allowing people to uh, sell their water rights where it is more needed? So as, as John Fleck mentioned, you know, the market fails us often in water. Water has very unique characteristics. Sometimes it's a private good, sometimes it's a public good. Markets can be useful, but you need all kinds of sidebars on them to make sure people don't get hurt. For example, when water leaves a community, and that community needs that water for its culture, for its environment, for its whole value system. Brad Udall, thank you very much. And I'm going to leave you with one more pearl of wisdom from your late great dad. Lord, give us the wisdom to utter words that are gentle and tender for tomorrow. We may have to eat them. But uh, thank you for your time Thanks, and thank you for your work on this, uh, this important issue. Um, why don't we just take a moment here, if you don't mind, to just take in this beautiful valley behind us. It's another spectacular sunset over Phoenix. You know, in the film business, we call this the golden hour. Uh, we asked for your input uh, and we got a tweet from the resistor sister who wrote, water is life, water will be more valuable than money. You know, Phoenix is just one of many Western cities where water from the Colorado River really does have more value than gold. Nearly 40 million people depend on the Colorado River for water. Inside the river basin, the big urban users are Phoenix, Tucson, and Las Vegas. But some clever engineering allows the water to extend its reach. People in Denver, Salt Lake City, Albuquerque, Los Angeles, and San Diego all drink, shower, and water their lawns with Colorado River water. But water usage in these cities has not grown with their populations. This artificial wetland in Phoenix is emblematic of why. The city created it as a way to treat its wastewater. Nearly every drop they use here is recycled. 
and the city has gotten very good at using less in the first place. Only about 10% of homes here have lawns today, down from about 80% in the 1970s. The cost of water increases 28% in the summer months to encourage conservation. In fact, Phoenix uses less water than it did 20 years ago, even though 400,000 more people live here. But they say they can conserve even more. I'm joined now by someone who knows a lot about municipal water conservation in the city of Phoenix and beyond. She was director of Phoenix Water Services for seven years and is now director of research at the Kyle Center for Water Policy at Arizona State University. It's somewhere out there. Catherine Sorensen, thank you so much for uh, being with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, yeah. You know, you've done a great job uh, collectively, you individually, but the city in, in conserving while growing. Mm -hmm. um, you, I get the sense that you've kind of gone after low-hanging fruit, or is it a little more complicated than that? It, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, certainly, we've done everything that we can to be very methodical and proactive in our planning, including for conservation. We look to conservation first. Um, and really try, we focused on changing the culture of how people view and use water in this valley over time. So instead of resorting to more um, reactive types of strategies that depend on what the Colorado River is doing or what the local rivers are doing, we've tried to instill in people a sense that, you know, if you're going to live here in the desert, you need to value water and you need to live responsibly and make wise water choices. For the most part, that strategy has been successful. You know, it's funny, as you're talking, I'm thinking about vaccines. You know, we have a lot of people <laughs> in this country who are anti-vax, as yeah. you know. Um, and yet, when you put out a call for this, they respond. Why? Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with um, the price of water. Um, you know, we do charge... Disincentives and incentives, uh, right? Uh, carrots and sticks. Yeah, right. So we charge more for water in the summer. And that sends a really important price signal. Uh, we don't have restrictions here. If someone wants to have a lawn, they can, but that lawn is going to need a lot of water in the summer and you're going to pay a lot of money for it. And so for the most part, people have made choices to go away from uh, water intensive landscapes towards more, you know, beautiful native desert landscaping. So we said earlier this is a dire situation currently. Um, it is. is this something you envision as, and has this been part of the planning all along? You know, it, it has. So water managers have planned methodically, proactively, carefully for decades. I mean, literally for generations. We have known since 1968 when the federal government first authorized the construction of the Central Arizona Project, that the canal that brings Colorado River water into our cities, We've known since that time that the day would come that that water would be shorted. And so we've been really careful. Um, we've uh, planned very carefully. We reuse our reclaimed water. We've managed our groundwater supplies. Um, we've entered into very important and um, you know, innovative partnerships to provide flexibility and resiliency. Um, you know, yeah, I, I feel like water managers here have really stepped up to the plate. You're, you're looking at the aquifer as a potential source. And you, you're, yeah. you're, this area has quite an aquifer beneath it, uh, several it hundred does. years of supply. It is does. that, um, it, when you start doing that though, that seems like a sign of desperation, doesn't it? Not desperation, but it is our savings account, right? So we wanna be really careful not to deplete our savings account. Uh, we are blessed to have very productive aquifers in central Arizona, but they're what we call fossil aquifers. So if you pump out too much, um, and you don't replenish it, over time, you'll lose that savings account. So we, we want to be careful about that, but it is here for times when we need it. It sounds like a last resort measure. <laughs> I, I disagree. I feel like we have managed it carefully. We need to continue to manage it carefully so that future generations have the opportunity to have a quality of life like the one we enjoy here today. But no, I, I feel like it's a good resource, and if we manage it carefully, it will provide for us. So yeah, you work on increasing the use of reclaimed water, conservation, continue on those trends, looking at the aquifer. What about down the road? Are there other ways? Could you go after, uh, say, brackish water and use desalinization? Have you, have you looked at some of those kinds of technologies as you look 
way toward the future. Absolutely. So um, we look, as I said, we look first towards conservation and, and use of reclaimed water. But certainly down the road, uh, we want to look at things like desalination of brackish groundwater, partnerships across the basin, uh, potentially desal on the California coast. There are opportunities out there, but I think it's incumbent on us first to use our water as efficiently as possible to reclaim what we have over and over again before we go out and try to augment our supplies. What about buying water rights from agricultural interests? Well, you know, uh, the, the Valley of the Sun was actually a, traditionally an agricultural valley, and we've been lucky to be able to grow on what were traditionally agricultural lands. And the net water use on that actually is a benefit because um, it takes less water to grow a subdivision than it does to grow cotton. So as we've urbanized, we've actually in total used less water. Um, there have been transfers from agriculture into the cities, um, and certainly we will look to those types of strategies in the future, but it's really important that that's done in partnership and in ways that benefit all sides and in ways that respect the, the character and culture of local rural communities as well. Kathy from Temecula offers this. We can zero escape, take short showers, but are there any large infrastructure ideas or plans for uh, saving our reservoirs and or moving water from flooded areas to parched areas? A lot of people talk about moving water as if it's easy to do that. Not so easy, right? It's not easy, it's expensive, but it's, it's what you have to do. So it's a great question. Um, actually, uh, much of Phoenix is dependent on the Salt and Verde rivers, which are local rivers that, that run through the Valley of the Sun. <clears throat> Um, North Phoenix in particular, though, um, is dependent on Colorado River flows. And as we see the flows of the river decline over time, that's a concern. So uh, Phoenix is investing about $500 million in uh, transmission mains and pump stations that allow us to move uh, salt and verde river supplies to areas of North Phoenix that are dependent on Colorado River supplies so that we can ensure reliable deliveries come what may. So this leads to the question you get uh, a lot, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, Vizkaya asked this one on YouTube. Is there any plan to limit building of new communities that will be using this resource? So it's really important to understand that um, since the 1950s, Arizona has added about 6 million people to its population. And yet we use basically the same amount of water. We are able to grow and not use more water. What we need to do though, is be careful about our land use choices. So denser cities use less water. So to the extent that we can grow on agricultural lands, there's, uh, you know, we use less water in, in, in total when we do that. And then to the extent we can grow densely and, and vertically, uh, we can create very water efficient cities. All right, Catherine, thank you so much, and, and we've really enjoyed your beautiful city. So, I'm so happy you're here. All right, it's a pleasure. Um, by a wide margin, the largest share of Colorado River water goes to agriculture, more than 70% of the allocations. In general, agriculture has senior water rights over cities. As the river diminishes, this sets the stage for conflicts between farms and cities. There's no urgent concern that the spigots will stop flowing here in Phoenix anytime soon. Catherine will make sure of that. But farmers in this part of the world are now learning what that is like. This is where the shortage meets the soil. Pinal County, desert farmland between Phoenix and Tucson. When the U.S. government declared an official shortage for the Colorado River in August, farmers here were cut off from their water. It first came here in the 1990s upon completion of the Central Arizona Project, a network of canals that sluices Colorado River water more than 300 miles across the desert. Colorado River water rights are based on seniority. First in time, first in right is the phrase. And these farmers are at the bottom of the list. They have tough choices to make. Some are calling it quits. Others will let their fields lie fallow for a time, hoping for wetter days to come. Still others are switching to crops that aren't as thirsty, like waiuli, a woody shrub that can be processed to extract rubber. Meanwhile, farmers at the other end of the seniority list are in high cotton, as well as a bowl full of greens. 
Farmers near Yuma, Arizona, and in the Imperial Valley of California, keep the salad bars open nationwide all through the winter. Joining me now live here in Phoenix is one of those salad bar suppliers. John Boltz is the co-owner of Desert Premium Farms in Yuma, Arizona. He's also the first uh, vice president for the Arizona Farm Bureau. Uh, John, thanks for, thanks for being with us. And uh, thank you for that excellent Caesar salad I had for lunch today. I assume you had something to do with that one way or another, right? I'm sure we did, and we appreciate that <laughs> yeah. you ordered it. Absolutely. All right, so senior rights, that, that's, that's a big deal around here, seniority system. Uh, in Yuma, uh, you're pretty much at the top of the list. How did that come to be? Well, we had great political leadership in the past that, that saw that you know, agriculture would need to have access to water to produce the important you know, food and fiber that everybody depends on every day. Uh, they knew that we would need infrastructure to deliver that water, and they put all that in place. We're really standing on the shoulders of giants when it comes to uh, doing what we do each day. And just give the numbers. It's pretty astounding how much of the greens we eat in the winter all throughout the country come from your part of the world. Yeah, anywhere from 70 to 90 percent, depending on the type of vegetable, all over the U.S. and Canada. So you have senior rights, but if you're a farmer, you're, you're worried about your water. That's a big deal. Uh, do you and your uh, fellow farmers in that part of the world worry much about losing water? I think we're vigilant about it is the right way to describe it. We know we can't do what we need to do for the rest of the population without water. Um, it literally is the air that we operate, uh, that journalists operate with, if you will. So we need it to do what we do. Is it appropriate, though, to plant crops that are particularly thirsty, like alfalfa? I know you have some alfalfa on your property in a place like this. And, and, and who makes the decision on what is the best use of that land? Well, wisely, those of us in agriculture have been uh, granted those senior rights. Uh, they're called beneficial use rights. So as long as we're using it for a beneficial use to grow crops that everybody benefits from, uh, that's why we have those rights. And yes, uh, we grow a lot of alfalfa here in the desert. Uh, it feeds dairy cattle and uh, other livestock that people eat. Ultimately, we're producing the things for people to eat uh, that they need every day. Question from YouTube, Martin Soon asks, should almond, raisins, and water-dependent vegetation be farmed in desert-like conditions in California? Should that type of agriculture be banned uh, in this kind of drought? Well, I think he's particularly talking about the Central Cal uh, Valley of California. I'll leave that to them to address, but I think sometimes people misunderstand when they look at you know, a desert region and say, you shouldn't grow that there. Um, sometimes that's a lack of information, and those of us in agriculture need to supply that information. It's imperative that people understand that, you know, the cotton, the almonds, the different crops that we grow in the desert regions and places in California and Arizona and New Mexico, uh, some of those things can't be grown anywhere else as productively and efficiently as where what we do here. So you are more efficient, but it's a, such a precious resource. So it's kind of a, it's a push and pull there, isn't it? It is, but it, I think it's wisely a precious resource that's been granted to agriculture because people knew that we would need large volumes of water to produce an abundant and affordable food supply. That's one thing here in the United States that we've enjoyed for a very long time. So why not grow less? Why not grow less yeah. cities or less food? Less food. Uh, less food. Well, we already import... Here, in this part of the world. Here in this part of the yeah. world. Well, we already import about 50% of the food that we consume in the United States. And... You know, it does start to become a national security issue, but it's really more of a practical issue. I think a lot of people identify that food should be grown, you know, in their own backyard. And if, if, not, if not in their backyard, well, then certainly as close as possible. And there are things we can do in this region, especially here in Arizona, that can't be done anywhere else. Farmers have uh, spent a lot of time and money and applied a lot of technology to conserve water. Tell us about that. Yeah, in my area down there in Yuma, the southwest corner of the state, over the last 30 years, through technology, improved types of crops that we grow, uh, we're producing about 30% more uh, product over the last 30 years with about 30% less water. So agriculture is learning to do with less and learning to do abundantly so. And there's more to squeeze there, if you will. Um, but we do reach a point where there are diminishing returns. You've got senior rights, though. Mm -hmm. uh, is there enough incentive when you're at the top of the heap there to conserve? You, the, or is it, if you know you're going to get the water no matter what, uh, are there disincentives to conservation? I don't think anybody in the desert believes that there's, 
you know, there's an endless supply of water. I think we're all cognizant of that. Uh, that's where some of the drive for efficiency comes from. That's where the, the drive as a farmer to produce more with less comes from. It's something we're working at every day. That's been a, a 10,000 year journey for those of us that grow the food and fiber that people need. Um, modern farmers are no different. In fact, we're accelerating that process. So the, the, the phrase that is used quite a bit is demand management. And what that means is farmers selling water rights to suburb, suburban entities or cities or whatever. And I know there's a, there's a controversial uh, transfer of water rights underway right now in this state. You're very much against that. Uh, it, it would take uh, agricultural rights and, and allow them to be used by a, a suburb of Phoenix. What's the matter with doing that? Is that is, isn't that a good way to allocate in a fair way, having the free market determine? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think so, because the, the most important thing for, for us is to be able to continue to produce food and fiber, and if not that, use water in those communities where that water was allocated. Uh, transferring water from basin to basin is something that most folks in agriculture are fundamentally against. We think our communities should have the opportunity to grow at the pace they should grow at. We think that growing crops is pretty important. I think people need them at least three times a day, right? But shouldn't you retain the right to sell your water rights if you want? Uh, surface water is a little bit different. The groundwater underneath your ground is a little bit different animal. Uh, that may have a marketability, but surface water rights, I think that's a different deal. And you have to get into talking to the, the legal folks about it, but uh, where we're using it for beneficial use for agriculture, that is a first and highest use. What is your biggest concern with the way water is used in this region now? I, I, I know that a lot of people uh, in this part of the world get upset about California's uh, use of its allotment, actually uh, beyond its allotment. Yeah, that's, that's been a challenge for the last 20 years or more. Uh, California grew faster than the rest of the region, and the federal government allowed them to take more water out of the reservoirs than what they had a right to, 4.6 million acre feet. So they're the largest user, but they don't contribute in times of rain for the most part to the Colorado River watershed. Whereas Arizona, over 90% of our, of our state drains into the river. So we're trying to live within our means here in Arizona. And I think the day of reckoning comes where we need to bring technology to bear along the coastlines to supply people. Water's there in the oceans, and if communities are gonna live along them outside uh, the Colorado River watershed, I think it's important that we look at desal and build the plants. What about uh, allocating water on a percentage basis, as was discussed here a moment ago? Um, that may be a possibility. That's a little bit above my pay grade, but I will definitely say that when we move towards limiting water for agriculture, or we move towards monetizing or putting a dollar figure on water, food's going to become dramatically more expensive. That's not anything any of us want. The whole rest of our economy and all of our livelihoods are based on affordable and abundant food. John Boltz, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate your insights and your perspective on all this. My pleasure. A hundred years ago, when representatives of the Colorado River Basin states came up with their plan to share this precious resource, there was an important stakeholder not given a seat at the table. Native American populations in 30 separate sovereign nations were not able to settle their claims from the outset. Over the years, many of them have negotiated allocations from the river, but the process was unjust from the start and unfair to this day and extremely complicated too. And this has led to shocking, unsanitary conditions on many reservations. It looks like a scene in the wake of a natural disaster. Darlene Arvizo is delivering water to residents of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico. But actually, it's just another day, part of the routine here. Running water is a pipe dream for 40% of those who live here. COVID brought the issue into a national light, and the climate emergency injects a sense of foreboding. It all goes back to the 1922 Colorado Compact. Native Americans were considered wards of the federal government, so none of the tribes had a seat at the table, an original sin. Without firmly established water rights, tribes are unable to get financing to build the infrastructure to deliver indoor plumbing. Many have worked around these obstacles by negotiating with the states for water allocations. In 2004, the Gila River Indian community reached a settlement with the state of Arizona. It granted this tribe triple its previous allotment of water. 
they are moving forward with a large irrigation project on their land to increase their agricultural productivity. Other tribes are not as far along. About a third of them are in regulatory limbo, still negotiating their exact allotments, still waiting for official settlements. Reverse engineering, this original sin of omission, remains a long work in progress. One of the people working on that reverse engineering process is Bidta Becker. She is an attorney at the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. Bidta, thanks for being with us. Thanks for making the trip. We appreciate it. Uh, reverse engineering, uh, trying to come up with uh, water rights that are way past due at a time of extreme scarcity. Very difficult problem. Walk us through the challenges. So the challenges, so this is a temporal question. As, as you suggested, there are some tribes that have been able to resolve their water rights, some tribes still haven't. When we're facing trout, it becomes much more challenging to resolve the water rights. But one of the constant themes throughout the entire history is even when we do resolve our water rights, we're challenged in putting them to use. The market doesn't respond, capital doesn't, doesn't flow. So even though we, have, we might have quantified rights, we haven't been able to put them to use like the city of Phoenix has. So when you say quantified rights, what, what, what are these rights? Where, where are they located? Why don't you have them? So this is part of the complicated nature of it, as you suggested. Tribes have what are called reserved rights that are implied under federal law. So you have states and, and federal law. What the negotiators of the compact knew at the time they were negotiating it was that much, that tribes had these federally reserved rights. They didn't know how much, they didn't know what they could be used for. So when we say quantified, it literally means how much water do you have the right to use? So, but the, it's not as simple as just asking for what is in that allocation. If right? only it were, Miles, <laughs> if only it were. Well, see, there are 30 sovereign nations. It's a very ad hoc process. Uh, and it's, it's extremely complicated. And, you know, I'm sure you're an excellent lawyer, but you probably are up against a lot of bureaucracy, kind of a Byzantine system, right? I, I will agree because the United States Department of Justice attorney used that exact term once, Byzantine. So you can either litigate those rights or you can settle those rights. And when you settle them, you're settling them with the state and the United States. The difference between the two is that in a litigation, it's going to be likely just one judge who's going to decide what the rights are after literally years of evidence. And the other difference is when you settle them, you usually get some funding from Congress so you can put the rights to use. Is it better to go to court or try to negotiate directly? As, as a tribal member, as an attorney, I believe sovereignty is best exercised when you have the hard negotiated conversations. You're, you, you represent your interest best and you can do that best at the negotiating table. It's not easy. It's in, let me just underscore that. It's not easy, but it's what, it's what we have to do. So you, the Navajo Nation, of course, is huge, and it, it, uh, you've got uh, three states that um, uh, the nation is in, uh, New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona. And you haven't settled in Arizona, and that's a lot of the problem that we're seeing here, the, the, the related issue of the sanitary conditions. Um, what, what's it going to take to get a deal in Arizona? What's it going to take to get a deal in Arizona? I don't know. What I, I can say is that negotiations have been going on for quite some time. The basin takes a, a lot of pride in resolving its problems through talking things out. I think that the COVID-19 issue has likely shined a light on the need to get water to tribal people on reservations to address the sanitary um, conditions that you've talked about. So what I'm suggesting is that there's, I think that there's likely gonna be a shift in the conversation because of the pandemic. Um, and I'm saying that partly because we've seen a shift in society at large. We've seen Congress respond through the infrastructure bill in providing unprecedented levels of funding to address the lack of clean access to drinking water on Indian reservations. So, so never waste a good crisis, right? One never of those waste situations. a good crisis. Let's talk a little bit about the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, there is uh, some significant money there, first of all, to help you uh, settle those claims, those water right claims? Yes, so there's very good. Um, there's 
I would say three buckets of money. One is for water rights settlements to resolve settlement to put money in settlements that have been entered into and we heard Brad talk about that earlier. Some of that funding will go to the Navajo Utah settlement where the Navajo Nation and state of Utah has entered into a settlement. The next bucket of money is for the Indian Health Service. In 1959, 1959 Congress created the Sanitation Facilities Construction Program in order to address the lack of clean drinking water to homes on reservations. That program has never been fully funded, and it's only been funded in the millions of dollars. And for the first time in the history of the country, on Friday night, the Congress, I, I'm, I apologize, I forgot to warn you, I tear up about this, because this, this is truly monumental. Congress is, is funding that program with $3.5 billion. It, I never would have thought I would have seen that in my lifetime. It took a pandemic, but never let a good crisis go to waste. That was the year I was born. 62 years? You've been waiting for this? 62 years. Wow. 62 years. That's a moment. It's a moment. So what's changing this? Is it is it because of COVID? Is it because of the reckoning of a racial injustice in this country? Is it because of the urgency of climate change? you got a lot of crises here. All of the above. But what I, but what I think's going on, Miles, is you, we ha you might have kids, I don't know if you do, mm -hmm. but we have kids and we raise them in this country. And I think they believed we lived in an equitable society. And then COVID-19 hit. You saw, it, depending on where you lived in the country, you saw the populations who got ravaged by that. American Indians were at the top of the list for uh, the highest rates of um, getting COVID, death and hospitalization. They were, we were at the highest rate up until the vaccinations. We are still at the highest rate for death and hospitalizations. But what I'm trying to say is all of the above, and our children are saying to us, mom and dad, you told me we lived in an equitable society. We don't, I'm marching in the street. What they don't know, and you and I know, is we have to come up with the solutions. They don't have the gray hair that we have that will help them come up with the solutions. But it's an exciting moment, Miles, because if we were talking about this after the 1912 pandemic, we wouldn't be talking about it. Yeah. So it seems like the conversation has shifted uh, because of all this. I mean, do you, do you, is it, did it just happen within the past couple of years or is this, has this been going on for a little while? I think, the, I think the role of the tribes, that conversation has been going on, I'd say for a good 10 years. The urgency, the reality, literally March 2020. You know, I, I had people calling me saying I had no idea. And these were people I worked with for 15, 20 years advocating to get clean drinking water on the reservations. But, you know, we're human beings. Somebody told me the other day we're squishy. And they were, they were concerned about me, right? They, they knew somebody and they were worried that I was suffering from this. Luckily, I wasn't. My community was. But, um, but yes, I, there was a... a tangible change in March of 2020. And just a final thought here. We, we think of water mostly, um, you know, as how you, how you take your shower and, and wash your car. In, in Native American cultures, it has much deeper meaning, doesn't it? It has tremendous meaning. So I, we could talk about the lower, uh, the, where John farms. We could talk a lot about the way the, those tribes see the water, but let me focus on Navajo. There are four rivers that surround us. San Juan that flows into the Colorado, the Colorado, the little Colorado that flows into the Colorado, and the Rio Grande. We see those as, see the rivers as li living beings. We say D and Diné in the Navajo language. We, they have protected us along with our four sacred mountains. And, and I would posit that it's not, I think also, it's not just that native people have a spiritual relationship. I think all people, as we heard Catherine talk about, you understand the value of water when you live in the desert, some of us more than others. But I think what this program is about is reminding all of us that water is precious. Bid to Becker, thank you so much. Uh, good luck in, in rectifying this longstanding injustice and getting the water that uh, your, your people deserve. So I wish you well, thank you. Uh, there was yet another stakeholder ignored in the Colorado River Compact, Mother Nature herself. All the dams and diversions were built to enable agriculture on a large scale and to support the rapid growth of Western cities like the one behind me. Here's a tweet from LAS Res Widow, 
Some of the people problems come from all the cities and states wanting more and more, but not looking at what happens to the river all the way down, leaving very little to those at the end. Plant, animal, humans suffer. Indeed, the river that runs through our discussion today is damaged in many places, and yet it is also resilient. The Colorado River is still a magical place to go with the flow of nature. Much of the river and its environment appear to be thriving despite the dams and diversions. But that is not the case south of the border in the river's delta. For most of the last 50 years, it baked in the sun as the river didn't flow any longer into the Sea of Cortez. In 2012, the U.S. and Mexico signed a historic agreement to allocate some water to help the environment. A first. A dam was opened and a so-called pulse flow of water rushed into the dried out delta, a scaled down simulation of the spring flooding that occurred naturally before humans harnessed the river. It's a win for the environment and also for the people who live beside this rejuvenated oasis in the desert. Joining me now is a person who spent more than two decades working to make that beautiful, emotional scene possible that you just saw. Jennifer Pitt is Colorado River Program Director for the Audubon Society. Uh, Jennifer, thanks for joining us here today. And I got to tell you, every time I watch uh, that shot of those kids playing in that uh, river delta, I get a little misty. Uh, you were there when it happened. Uh, what's that like after 20 years of pushing, pushing, pushing to see it finally happen? You know, I... Uh people who live next to a river that doesn't flow, I think really come to understand what it means to lose something and then to see it come back uh, was really a moment of celebration. And the environmental community had been working to bring some small amount of flow back to the Colorado River Delta uh, for a long time, as you pointed out. Uh, and we were really doing it thinking about ecosystem values. And we always said it's for nature and for people. And it wasn't until we stood there in the Mexicali Valley and saw that spontaneous party emerge that we really understood what it meant. People feel a connection to nature. Yeah, if I'm getting misty, it must have been a lot of, well, waterworks for you, if you will. Uh, all right, so what you accomplished in the grand scheme, still is modest, right? It, it connected the river briefly, briefly to the Sea of Cortez. Um, what does that mean in the grand scheme of things and what lies ahead? Is this something, I mean, you know, this is a scarce time for water. Is there water to spare to keep that delta going? Of course, there's water for the river. The question is, can we collectively, as Colorado River stakeholders and the politicians who lead us, figure out how to make that possible. And what makes me optimistic is we did it after nearly half a century of almost uh, no water making it into the Delta. The United States and Mexico, who had really managed the river at great arm's length, at a great distance, figured out how to work together and collaboratively, cooperatively, uh, restore some water, and some life uh, to that ecosystem at a very small scale. That water is less than 1% of the river's annual average flow. Okay, and so you've had a second pulse flow since then. Will there be a more in the future? Do you have to renegotiate or is this locked in to the future of the river? Well, right now we have a few years where we uh, expect to have some more water in the river between now and 2026. Uh, but we will have to negotiate again. And ultimately, as the two countries and the philanthropic supporters of the nonprofits working there to restore habitat make those investments and we see the forests reemerge, I am hopeful that we can uh, see permanent uh, commitments to supporting a very modest restoration of a ribbon of green through that delta. If it is inconsistent and you have dry years where you don't uh, allow that water in there, does that do a lot of harm or is it resilient enough uh, with a little bit of water to maintain all the work you've done? I think the 
you know, we're experimenting and we're learning and we are trying to optimize the very small supply of water that we have. And we know that those forests that have been planted can survive a few years without uh, a big flow of water through the river. Um, but we're gonna learn over time just how resilient it is. And I think uh, effectively, if we want the wildlife to return, the birds and the beavers, as well as the people, um, the river is essential. So how did you get a seat at the table? Environmentalists, uh, in 1922, there weren't any of those. No. Uh, but the fact that you were there as part of this negotiation is significant. It is, and you know, in the 60s and 70s, there was a, sort of a setup of a controversy over the dams and diversions on the Colorado River, and um, it became quite contentious. And when I started working with colleagues on thinking about the Delta in the late 1990s, we could look back and see that that controversy and that sort of movement of protest had not really gotten anything for the Delta. And uh, we started a different approach, and we started to think about what would bring the United States and Mexico working more closely together. And in fact, to get their attention, we started to think about what else could change between the U.S. and Mexico. So today, the agreement that allows us to have this very modest ecosystem restoration in the Delta also has brought the U.S. and Mexico into shortage sharing agreements. The treaty from back in 1944 that allocated Mexico its share of water did not specify how shortages would work. And I would say that at this moment, it is essential that the two, two countries are working closely together to figure that out. So uh, it is a lesson for environmentalists on being a little bit pragmatic. Coming in and saying, tear down the Hoover Dam, you don't get very far, do you? You know, there are lots of ways to do environmental advocacy. I have found that this way is effective. So the river is resilient, um, but not unaffected uh, elsewhere, not just the Delta. Uh, seasonal flows are important for all of the, the riparian species, et cetera, and the fish for that matter. Um, how would you characterize the overall health? I mean, because it's, it's beautiful and, and wonderful in many places. There are thousands of miles of rivers in the Colorado River Basin, and uh, we know that some areas have been quite impacted by dams and diversions over a century of development that has brought us the life that we know in the West today. Um, unfortunately, what we're seeing now as climate change impacts begin to unfold more and more dramatically, that uh, there are times when there are, there's no flow in rivers upstream, not just in the Delta. And on top of that, wildfires are increasing throughout the West, and some of those are creating um, sediment uh, slides into the river, degrading water quality. The fish can't survive when there's no water in the river, and all of us who depend on the river have trouble when quantity and quality are impacted. So at the bottom line, um, as an environmentalist, when you're worried about protecting nature in the river, and there's so many other demands here, five million, you know, bathrooms at least down there, right? And then some. How um, is it difficult to keep that seat at the table? Uh, I think our best hope for keeping the seat at the table is to be good partners, um, to bring good ideas, to align our solutions with solutions that work for other stakeholders. And I also think that for a long time, the business of water management was taken care of by um, people of a particular demographic in a back room without a lot of public uh, view, without a, lot, without a lot of transparency. And I started out by saying, people feel a connection with nature and I don't think we want to live in a West that becomes deprived of that essential quality that brought a lot of us here in the first place. If we don't figure out how to take care of uh, this place, I'm not sure that we'll make it in the long run. Jennifer. 
Pitt, thank you very much, and good luck uh, taking care of this beautiful river, this beautiful resource. Thank you. We really appreciate your participation in this water summit. Let's take a few moments to let all of you weigh in. From Twitter, Jimmy C tweets this, the climate waits for no man. Don't delay or else it'll be too late. El Emin Opi tweets, on the brink, you're only 30 years late on your reporting. Well, thanks a lot. Bob Harrison tweets, reduce the population. We got a lot of things like that. Aaron Musfeld tweets, as long as the population continues to grow, it will put more pressure on the river to provide. It is a resource that can only replenish itself so fast. And here is our next question on video. I'm Chris Mangini, located in Woodstock, Vermont. Yeah, my question derives from seeing that there was a rain bomb in northern and central California last month. And I was curious how much that uh, three to four inches of rain that fell pretty quickly uh, impacted the drought overall. Like, can we quantify it as, you know, inches in a reservoir and how much of that does actually trickle down to southern California to help their problem out down there? So we brought back John Fleck uh, to be our resident expert and take in all the questions. John, thank you. Um, so I, I remember reading about that rain. I thought, oh, hey, drought's over, maybe. Yeah. Not so, huh? Well, no, I mean, it takes more than one storm. Um, it takes a winter of storms to help. But rain and snow in Northern California actually can help on the Colorado River because the plumbing system in the West is so interconnected that provides potential water supply through the State Water Project of California to Los Angeles, Southern California, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which reduces the Met's need for water out of the Colorado <laughs> River. We've built this plumbing system that extends all the way from Northern California down to LA and out to, you know, my home in Albuquerque and Denver in the Front Range. So, so the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone, but it is a, it's not <laughs> it's, direct, right? It's not direct, yeah. it's indirect. But importantly, it takes more than one storm. All right, so we have another video question for you. Let's listen to it. My name is Ed Brock Smith. Isn't it about time that farmers and city dwellers reevaluated the use of water for their crops and their lawns? Okay, I, I think there's probably, John, a fair amount of evidence that uh, we've heard it just now that both city dwellers and farm interests are conserving and reevaluating. Is it enough, though? So one of the things that amazed me as I really dug into this over the last 15 or 20 years is how successful at water conservation we've been. Municipal um, use is down even though population is growing and farmers like John Bolt and the folks down in Yuma are growing more crops with less water. So we've been enormously successful. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is climate change is racing at us in a way that requires us to do even more of those things. But the important message is that those things that we have done well, we now know how to do, and we're just going to need to do more of them and do them better. All right, we have one more video question for you. Let's roll it. My name is Monty Robertson, and I'm located in the San Luis Valley in southern Colorado. My question is, why doesn't anyone have the guts or the leadership to address the real problem? And that's being overpopulation in arid climate zones. If I had to pick uh, the number one question we receive from everybody is this issue of uh, overpopulation, overgrowth, uh, all the things that uh, are quite obvious when you look at this beautiful city and how it's grown here in the desert. Right. Uh, how do you answer that one? Do, do we need to stop all the growth? I think the answer is no. I think, importantly, communities have to make their own decisions about what they want to be in the future and what their available water supply is and how they want to approach that challenge. So. It is possible to have a lot more people in this valley um, if we have less outdoor watering, if we lose our trees, if we lose our lawns, if we lose our gardens. We can be enormously efficient with our indoor watering. It's a question of what do you want your city to look like. If, we, if we're willing to give up on the single family home dream and have much more dense housing, can be far more efficient water-wise. So it's really a choice of what kind of city we want. But I worry that people who object to this kind of population growth um, sometimes use water as an excuse um, and in unfortunate ways. So um, Stay Tuned tweets this. Uh, what can other states do? We talked a little bit about this earlier, but I think there's this idea that we can just 
you know, put a put yeah. a straw on Lake Superior and send it over here yeah. would be set. What can other states do that are water abundant? Washington, for example, to aid the water needs of states like California, or for that matter, here. You, we really can't work at that scale. Water is so the, the the important, meaningful, usable quantities of water to run a house or a farm are so enormous that you can't move that quantity of water from one place to another. Um, we just can't do that. Um, I, I, would, I would suggest that um, uh, if you eat less burgers and pizza cheese, that might reduce the demand for alfalfa. But I got to say, I had a burger for lunch. <laughs> um, um, so I think there are broader changes. But there's a point that Brad Udall often makes, um, which is one of the things that we all can do is focus on the greenhouse gas reduction part. Um, and, and that's not going to help us deal with the short term problems we've been talking about here this evening. But our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren in order to have a Phoenix and an Albuquerque. Um, we need to get greenhouse gas emissions under control, um, reduce the impact of climate change for those future generations. We heard from Pat Terrell, who is former Wyoming state engineer, who is a friend of yours. Uh, he said this, the upper ba basin is investigating demand management, has implemented drought operations through the Bureau of Reclamation, and is committed to continuing the seven state process we've used for two decades to address serious issues in the Colorado River Basin. More than any river in the country, I think this one and the people within its reach finds a way to meet the challenges. Is that, is that remain true to this day? You know, it does. Um, I remain fundamentally optimistic about what's possible in this basin. We have this collaborative governance structure. We have this community of people, and you've seen many of them here this evening. We have um, significant successes in water conservation, in water sharing, um, in um, negotiating the new kind of agreements we, we need. Um, we have this adaptive capacity, and, and that's kind of an uplifting, optimistic thing. Um, the climate change um, piece of this is happening so quickly that it is really testing that, but, but I, I fundamentally remain optimistic that the sort of things Pat is talking about, that collaborative structure and those experiences we've gained to date, um, give us what we need, but we have a lot of work to do. So whiskey is for drinking, water for fighting. Is it still true then, though, or is there a looming you know, fight that's going to happen here as it gets, as the know, scarcity continues? I think I think there is not a fight. There are some fighting words. There's always sort of conflictual language. People stake out tough negotiating positions to try to preserve some water for their own community. But ultimately, we have seen time and again collaboration take over um, uh, and success come from that collaboration. And that experience of collaboration yielding success um, is embedded in the community of people who are working on this problem today. To what extent uh, does what happens here uh, offer you know, an emblem, a poster child, whatever you like, for the rest of the world as it contends with climate change? This is kind of a, you know, we talked about it being a leading edge indicator. Yeah. Um, is this a litmus test for whether we can grapple with climate change? Well, it, it is in important ways, and in some ways it's not. One of the important ways it is not is it is much easier to do the sort of things we have done in the Colorado River Basin in the rich world. Um, we have affluence that buys us the adaptive capacity that poor nations do not. And I worry about uh, poor nations. Um, the, the construction of the sort of human capital, the social capital, the bonds among people um, is strong here and there are places where we have challenges that it's not. But ultimately, I think there are important lessons to be learned from the successes we have, we have made here um, in the Colorado River Basin that do apply um, throughout the world. Yeah. All right, John Fleck, we'll be watching. Uh, and thank you for all your help uh, this evening as we sort out what is a very complex issue. Uh, and really a great conversation with everybody and I appreciate it. Uh, we want to thank the public television program, This American Land, and the Water Desk at the Center for Environmental Journalism at the University of Colorado Boulder. They're very helpful to us with uh, video and other requests. And thanks to all of you for being a part of Tipping Point, River on the Brink, from South Mountain Park, overlooking beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. The sun now has set. I'm Miles O'Brien. Good night. Funding for this program is provided by...